And welcome to another edition of Hawaii in Uniform. I'm your host, Calvin Griffin. And for those of you who may have seen the program before, you know that basically what we talk about on this program is what's happening with the military, the veterans, and the community, and how it affects um, the Hawaii, here in Hawaii, anyhow. I met a lot of very special people, but today I have a very special guest that um, has a story that's very interesting, very compelling, and does have a con it's not only about um, the human spirit, surviving, and also we have some elements of the international intrigue also. But um, the gentleman I want to introduce you to is Mr. Jen Chong Chen. And um, former military, he did two tours, I mean not two tours, he did uh, two enlistments. Uh, he was uh, originally from Taiwan, came in 1976, and joined the U.S. military in 1977. And uh, right now I'll tell you, I'll just introduce you to Mr. Chong. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. It's my greatest Good. honor to be here today. Great. I'll tell you what, um, tell us a little bit about, your, uh, about yourself. I know you came from Taiwan. Yes. And uh, what year was that? was 1976? Yes, I was uh, coming to Hawaii, uh, through Hawaii to American Samoa, so specific, mm -hmm. to meet with my elder brother at the time he was there, and then he invited me to come over to the island. But during the first year of his day, I uh, happened to be a, a Vietnam War hero, mm -hmm. a family uncle named Gone. Of those, he passed away many years ago after he put me in the army. Yeah. He was uh, the hero to come to tap in my door uh, when I was there. And he was the one to process my uh, paperwork that got me uh, through the examiner from Hawaii to take the test and all the paperwork, the whole package. Mm -hmm. And finally put me in the army. So I was in Honolulu, 1977, February 14, I believe, to sign my official the first contract mm -hmm. entering the army. Oh. When you, where did you take basic training at? Uh, the basic training was well, Fort Knox, Kentucky, February. Mm -hmm. Awesome, beautiful winter. I have never seen snow in my life, yeah. but because of the snow, uh, I is too cold for me. Mm -hmm. A person like from Taiwan, from Asian region, we never see the snow. Yeah. And my finger cannot move, my leg cannot move. But I struggled and made it through and graduated from uh, the basic training in Fort Knox, Kentucky. It was very amazing. And my real sergeant, everybody yeah. likes me. Oh, <laughs> I was great. very happy. <coughs> um, I know you were awarded several times. There were certain things in your first deployment. Uh, you went to uh, you go to Korea first, or where? No, I was uh, the first assignment. I choose to have the European assignment, mm -hmm. Germany, the NATO command. So I went uh, this September, I believe, uh, when we got there to Georgia, the airport, the Air Force of uh, Leap Command, mm -hmm. over the midnight, uh, across the ocean, then Atlantic Ocean, then we were there. The next day, a very cold September in uh, West Germany. At the time, and there was a lot of terrorism act going on during the city of uh, right. uh, the, the Frankfurt, Germany. Mm -hmm. And we were told not to be running around, you know, and stay in the compound, stay safe. But uh, I was there for a couple of years and uh, completed the assignment. Later, I was uh, awarded to uh, some of the military, the, the outcome, I believe, based yep. on my military performance. You had a parachute badge also that you had? Well, that was later, uh, mm -hmm. back to uh, the, later after I came back from Korea, the second uh, overseas command with second infantry, second infantry division, mm -hmm. very close to DMZ, right. the military zone. Anyway, I came back and got an award, and then later I was assigned to Fort Lewis, Washington, then I was there, picked up and recruited by the worldwide recruitment by the, by the Pentagon, mm -hmm. one of the one was very special, unique element uh, in Virginia. And then they, they come selected me and bring me into or the, the desert environment for the, what they so called the training evaluation program. Mm -hmm. And the start out with a hundred some people, <laughs> but then to the end, I was very lucky right. to be selected. Uh, I was one of the eight survival. Mm -hmm. So then I, ever since I been switched, been transferred to uh, Washington. Mm -hmm. And then they put me in a Van Heer farm, Warrington, Virginia, that's where I was. Although that none of us ever wear the military uniform ever since. Yep. Everybody have a long hair, and uh, we don't need to get into the detail, but that was how I come to Washington. Right, yeah. okay. So we were participating in some 
as we would say, uh, classified operations that, of course, you were not deliberately to speak about right now. But um, you apparently they've seen a lot of potential within you and your talents as far as in the military environment, I guess. Yes, and then a lot, you know, because of the MI and then the environment mm -hmm. allow me to have access to see lots of secrecy stuff. Mm -hmm. Really, that was a great learning process and then oh, really opened up my eye to learn something new. Wow, that's just another world. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm so proud to be one of my elements. But uh, after that for a while, then, you know, I had to move on, so I went back. The, after 1986, then I decided to separate from the active duty. Uh, at the time, I was uh, you know, in the state of Maryland. Mm -hmm. uh, I was there. I, I went up staying there for all together, from and back about 15 year Washington area, mm -hmm. experiencing all the, the fantastic, the cold winter. Uh, observed that I attempted to make a couple trip back to Taiwan to visit my old. Asian parents. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so, <clears throat> I'm sorry. You traveled around the United States a lot. You had made, and you were in the country about 15 years or so, or before you. Uh, I was uh, in and out because of uh, just for the military assignment. I mm -hmm. started my journey as a military service member. Mm -hmm. Went to Germany and come back, and then. Uh, Reassignment in states, and then I went back to Korea volunteer basis, the hardship tour, mm -hmm. second infantry division, and then I came back to uh, the states, and then we become one of MI member in the Washington D.C. Right. So uh, up to that while, you know, during my civilian life, yes, I did a lot of uh, travel across the country, in and out. Right. Especially during my time uh, with my parents in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Why I decided to go up there because of uh, I. Up to the second tour, and then you know that was the first tour I got out in 1986. But then, in uh, the civilian life, I thought that, that was important for me as a married, uh, the married man. I married to uh, the beautiful Chinese model in the Washington D.C. area. So I decided, well, I take up several of the civilian job, but it was not enough. Up to the, the discussion with my wife, I decided to go back to the army again. Mm -hmm. To try to maybe uh, retire 20 years, uh, but the original plan, but didn't make it. I went up uh, getting uh, the hardship tour assignment back to Korea again, uh, involuntarily, and then happened to be uh, during the crisis about uh, the country have a war with uh, the pushing Gulf. Mm -hmm. And then during that time, I was assigned to 2nd Infantry Division, the Light Infantry Mechanized Battalion. The unit was called to go to the battlefield. But before even we take off, suddenly we see the beautiful photo on the TV. Uh, the Southern Hussein people surrender, lined up. Wow, beautiful, awesome image mm -hmm. on the desert. Surrender right. to America. So then the war <coughs> ended, so I did not have to go. Right. I sent a clear message, quick message through AT&T to my my wife informed her, well, I guess uh, the God just gave me out from the battle, yeah. and even I, I'm ready to go, but this is how it happened. Mm -hmm. and she said, well, I'm glad it's over, and we won the war, so you're the, instantly to become an instant right. the hero, but I'm not. Yeah. Well, the reason, as far as with your military background, yes. and uh, you know, your personal history, as far as, like, say, your, your ethics, uh, the way you handle yourself, before you got in the military, but also with your military services. That, did that have any impact on how you were able to survive this, again, uh, difficult journey and, as you say, amazing escape? I want to segue into that because, like I say, it's important, of course, that we you know, acknowledge your uh, military career and what you've done there also. But could you set it up briefly as far as what happened, where you had this experience in Vietnam, how you were uh, in captivity, and this was after the war, you weren't a prisoner of war, but you were a prisoner, like say, in her um, penal system for uh, nine years and 25 days, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, if you can tell us a little bit about that. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, my journey, uh, actually, when I, the first trip, when we visited uh, the Han, I mean the Saigon, used to be Saigon, and I become Ho Chi Minh City after uh, the North Vietnam took over way back. 
But my initial visit was 2000 when uh, President Clinton and both lady and their daughter Chelsea was there. That was, uh, it must be the November, December period, mm -hmm. back to 2000. I was there to help in New York to set up their offices. I spent all together 45 days there, and then the, during the ramp up period, they have a technician. Yeah. And then what happened, I went back there, and then uh, unfortunately the second trip, 2001, I got arrested right away uh, after the second day. So okay. ever since, I was in their prison system, and then I have encountered a uh, very, very difficult life yeah. the entire time, yes. Just one question, point of clarification. Yes. The company you're working for, a telecommunications company based out of New York and New Jersey, operating out of there? Yes. And that's how initially you first got to uh, Vietnam? Yes, exactly. Okay. What happened before then, I was working as a civilian after I got out of the Army a second time. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was a, a good idea to move my wife, relocate um, me and her to uh, the warmer place. Nevada is, happened to be not just warm, very hot place, right. avoiding the heavy snow. So then I was working for the NOS communication under the older highway. Maybe they're still there, still exist. NOS communication. Got to know one of the vice presidents. They have at least three vice presidents. This person from uh, St. Kitt, I believe, Caribbean country. Anyway, he introduced me to New York. I asked about communication officers, the, the big guy. One of them happened to be uh, the, the person that owned the FCC license, Federal Communication Commission. All right, so they, after the full partnership, discussed and talk it over, they decided to have somebody like me. Mm -hmm. And I was the chosen one because they got to know me. Right. And my military background may be quite capable to their view. So I just can speak Mandarin Chinese. Knowing that there's a lot of Chinese speakers in Vietnam may be helpful. So I was a chosen one to put in Vietnam to help them set up their offices. But then the second trip was a disaster. I went and then because of uh, the technical failure, although that I'm not the technician anything, and then I don't know nothing about the satellite. So they already hired their, uh, the worker, sent in the engine technician on the ground, in the ground, waiting for me. Every day I received the message, you need to come in, Mr. Chen, and also New York, the direct contact, Mr. Uh, Michael Eskenazi, we believe he's a, 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 a Russian Jew. He said, you must go because he, he helped set it up, and this technician cannot speak the local language. He cannot speak Chinese, only English, and you know the location. So you'd be the one to go to help him. So I said, well, at this point, I, I, I cannot just abandon everybody, even... So I already feel a degree of, um, you know, the uncomfortable feeling. So I went. And then uh, next day, I was arrested. Yeah. Apparently, later on, I found out that was already a setup. Mm -hmm. The technician already compromised with the, the Gong An, which means the security officer, local authority, to arrest me. Right. And then later, they decided to let him go and then put me in jail for him instead. Oh. So when you had... Um Okay, you went there the first time, and basically you were there to facilitate setting up a facility, and you weren't part of the uh, technical part or anything else, but there was someone else that was in place. And the second time, you said you had a bad feeling before you went back in the country? Mm -hmm. Exactly. The first time I went, basically, uh, looking for three locations in the whole German city, as long as the beauty and the window can see each other mm -hmm. for their uh, telecom purposes, to maybe relay the signal, mm -hmm. the telecom signal. Uh, by using the microwave from right. one building to the other. That was uh, the concept, uh, the principle, I believe. So I already said that uh, Michael, he himself, went through a big struggle to bring uh, lots of heavy cables through the whole gym in the airport. He thought he was not going to get out of the airport at all. He kept on screaming when I was there waiting outside the airport. Mm -hmm. Heaven got through it, and he put all them together. I don't know nothing to help him, but right. only the physical lifted. By second trip, what happened? was because of our, they were running into the technical problem, so they already sent the technician ahead of me to go mm -hmm. down there to try to fix it, apparently fail again. Oh. So they, they decided to help me go down there and maybe help him right. anyway. Yeah. Tell you what, I don't want to make sure we don't miss anything, so we're okay. going to take a short break. When we come back, when we continue the story, and again, uh, again, it's called Difficult Journey, an Amazing Escape, and uh, please stay tuned, and we'll be back here on Hawaii in Uniform with Mr. Chen. Thank you. 
Aloha and mabuhay. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming salamat po, mabuhay, and aloha. <laughs> Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Okay, you're back with Hawaiian Uniform again. I'm your host, Calvin Griffin. And uh, right now, as I mentioned uh, prior to the break, uh, we have Mr. Uh, Chen, who uh, is the author of a book called Difficult Journey, Amazing um, Escape, and uh, would like to continue. So at this point right now, you have, you're back on the second time to Korea, I mean to um, mm -hmm. Vietnam, all right? And then, like I said, that's when everything started going south as far as when you were... Um, arrested or detained by the government. Um, yeah, if you continue with that, please. Yes, after I was uh, arrested, apparently there was a setup. Mm -hmm. So uh, during the evening, uh, when the, the technician invited me into the Indian, he's Indian from India, mm -hmm. to the Indian restaurant, uh, I said, oh yeah, okay, good idea. So I went. After we sit for only five minutes, a short duration, boom, here come two minivans rushing. Mm -hmm. Oh, and pulling in like a 16 uh, the uniform police. And the only thing they say is it was stand up, no talk, stand up, no talk. I said, oh my God, my instinct feeling was right. Mm -hmm. It was a setup. So then we waited up there for a while, and suddenly I, they, they escorted one of the ladies coming to talk to me. Oh, I identified that lady right away. She was one of the building, the general manager that rented the office for me. So the police, the Gong An, they called Gong An, the police asked her, is this the Mr. Chen that rented office from you? She said, yes, that's Mr. Chen, that's all. She turned around and laughed. So after that, we were booked into the two different minivan. I was on one van and the, the technician on the other. Mm. But from that point on, I never see him until the same point, uh, point a few months later. Anyway, they asked me to, uh, they want me to help them find out where is your office location? Where are they? Show me. So I, I tell them, first one would be the Saigon, the, uh, the, what is, uh, the wing where there's uh, the big avenue mm -hmm. linked to the city hall, first office, on the 10th floor of the San Juan Tower, as my story mentioned. Then they, they check everything, and then they found the office, and then there's a big table. Behind the table is a, a binder. And then the, 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 the binder, behind the binder, oh my God, it discovered a lot of heavy type of uh, telecom communication equipment, yep. the micro install. Yep. From there, we moved to the uh, second point, the Saigon, uh, the hotel, where they discovered it on the terrace on the six, sixth floor. Uh, that's where uh, micro installed the uh, microwave, uh, and I mean, the, the dish, mm -hmm. the dish that facing upward to the sky, the receiving the frequency from the satellite, yep. this, uh, you know. It, into the system. Right. Uh, Just a point ahead. of clarification. With the, um, the telecommunications, the reason why you were there in country anyhow is because this was a business venture to go ahead and be able to, for the Vietnamese uh, who were in the United States or around the country to get and receive messages from their family members in country. Ideally, that was correct. Uh, there was, uh, you know, New York, they are the telecom giants, so they know uh, what benefit them the most. And this is one of the, uh, the uh, compelling projects that they always want to do. So what happened at that time, I see the market value, one minute for the call. You may have to pay more than $1 for per minute's call. Uh, linking from America, anywhere from America, 
to the satellite, our system to Ho Chi Minh City from there yeah. to anywhere their family is in the entire Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So it's very uh, variable that is the whole concept, the whole focus to bypass in the local authority. Yeah. Okay. Um, since we're uh, limited on time, I want to really get back to the, say, the really important part. And I know that you were kept in solitary confinement for a number of months before you were um, had access to the consulate or any type of outside uh, support? Up to uh, been trial, been sentenced. Mm -hmm. They transfer all the way uh, through the Borlaug Central Distributing Center. From there, we got our specific assignment into the permanent station, which is Ham Deng. Mm -hmm. Entire the South Vietnam, this is the biggest. This Ham Deng has consists of at least of seven uh, prison camp, and we are the K4. The prison number four. That's where all the foreigner is. The team four stays in it only for men and women from a foreign country. Right. That's where I was, and it started trying to struggle and try to uh, get attention of a U.S. consulate, mm -hmm. urging them hurry up and come see me because I was among the very poorest of a foreign prisoner who never have an income, no visit, no support, nothing. Yeah. And I was there maybe dying. Mm -hmm. So I finally got in touch with. Uh, uh, the U.S. consulate get their attention to one of a secret phone call outside the compound yeah. during my uh, time for the, the see the dentist. Yeah. So I call them, they, they finally came visit me, and then ever since I have a little bit of support, which means like uh, every three months they will come over like $150 divided by three, so each month I have like $50 to survive, all the way until I finish my term in the prison. Yeah. Okay, so while you were Kept under these conditions, the American consulate, they were in brief contact with you, or what kind of, uh, with any support at all, but you being an American citizen? And first of all, I think as far as the clarification, what charge did the Vietnamese government get you on, and how what were the years that you were sentenced to? Right. Originally, the, the narrative, they read as uh, the stealing government, no, uh, uh, operating business without a license. Okay. Uh, I say, well, if so, it could be very light. I pay a small fine and go home, but it's not. Later, they decided to change the narrative. Mm -hmm. After they let the, uh, the technician go home, accept the bribing, I don't know how many thousand they gave to exchange their uh, freedom. Yeah. And instead, they put me in the prison. Mm -hmm. And then gave me 13 year sentence by saying, you are stealing our state-owned property, the telecoms owned by the state government. And at that time, there's no uh, private license yet, not open to the public. So with that, uh, the, con con uh, the, the concept, they gave me comfortably a uh, 13-year sentence and then observed that I served uh, under good behavior. I actually served in the prison term uh, eight, nine years and 25 days. Finally, I was set free, but it's not completely free. And after that a while, after the U.S. consulate come pick me up uh, outside the guest house from prison back to Ho Chi Minh City. That's, when another typical journey began yeah. in the Ho Chi Minh City. Yeah. So when you were arrested, um, your wife was with you in country at the time, anyhow. She was, uh, at some point, allowed to leave the country. The technician, I'd like to say that you that worked with you that had all the expertise in the telecommunications setup, anyhow, he was released back, to, he was able to leave the country. So the time that you spent in, in the, the prison camp, anyhow, I know it was, uh, I guess, unimaginable. I, like I read your book, and it's really extraordinary what you went through. And what are some of the, just some of the, the incidents that happened, like say, that really shaped you? Because for a lesser individual who wasn't really dedicated, had a strong mind, it seemed like they wouldn't have lasted in that type of environment. What are some of the things, like say, that uh, you'd like to share with our... Yes, and the really challenging life was during the permanent station of Hamdeng, Hamdeng Prison. You know, significantly because of, uh, after I report into the camp and then uh, I got to know the uh, team officer. Then uh, one week later, you issue in full set of uniform ever since we've been forced to go uh, out to our uh, working location, march into the field and escorted by AK-47 behind in the prison uniform like a military. Everybody learned to have a straw head because of over there, we have uh, six months of uh, extensive uh, the raining season. Yeah. And anyway, everybody is soaking wet, but regardless of weather condition, you must go. 
and they were walking back in, in and forth in the rain and also working in the rain, but they're giving me a big piece of the land to cultivate and grow some vegetables to self sufficient. Right. And then the, 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 to survive anyway, because I'm the I'm on the very poorest but the prison. But uh, what most significant, another thing I'd like to mention was, uh, even I was very poor, but my mind is very clear. And then what the, the treatment that we receive in, during the prison term, like the food that we have, the rice and the soup, and then the, the, they claim that they give us uh, so much of the food, or the, the pork, the meat, but all that is bologna, it's not real. So yeah. I decided to organize a protest, organize all the, the foreigners, telling them, don't go to work, stay in today. We demand to have a meeting with the principal. And then we need to get a couple of things clear. How can we let it go on like this? Yeah. They continue forcing us to work in the rain, and then our regions not even giving us a piece of a raincoat and asking all of us, the foreigners, to perform. We've been treated like worse than the slavery. Right. Well, say, so under these conditions, you organized or was instigated, well, you actually, you instigated and, and set up this protest. Knowing under those conditions, like say with the uh, as far as what's known as you know, it's very tough conditions, the possibility that you could have been executed for even as instigating something like this at all. Yes, true. Uh, I already thought about that, but that uh, besides, nevertheless, okay. what come to my mind yeah. because I'm the military background, and even though that I went, I was in the foreign prison, but my mind never changed. Right. You know, my, my, uh, yeah. the DNA is different. Right. And then nobody is going to stop me at that moment because if I don't talk, who else is going to get up there yeah. and talk? At least we try to uh, change for better, to yeah. benefit everybody, all the prisoners. We are all the victims. Yeah. We are in the same book. That okay. is why. Again, we uh, really apologize. We're down to the, the, the wire on this thing anyhow. But as far as, like I said, with the information that you had while you were in prison, like I said, you were in country, the, the time you spent there, you were able to gain information concerning, like say, information about POWs and, and the MIA issue. I know I really apologize for this, like say, that we don't have more time and help. I'd like to do a follow-up, but as far as how can they get your book and... Um, yes, please, uh, because knowing that we are running out of the time, observes the MIA, uh, POW, very uh, key focus. But please visit the Amazon.com and search for my book title, Typical Journey, Amazing Escape, for more detail. Thank you for bringing me here today. Yeah. Aloha. Good. Mr. Chen, thanks, Landon. Like I say, it's really amazing what you've been through and what you're doing, like I say, as far as further and after you got out of the country in hell. But again, we're down to the wire. I want to do a follow-up on this, and I encourage anybody to do the same thing in hell. But thank you for your time. Thank you for your service. And uh, that's about it. And thank you for tuning in, and God bless, and until that time. Thank you, and I look forward to see you in the near future. Thank you.